I'm Paola Poletto, Director of Engagement and Learning, and I'm joined today by... Kenneth Brummel, I'm the Associate Curator of Modern Art at the Art Gallery of Ontario. Thank you all for joining us. Um, today we're going to talk about grids and tonal painting. Uh, it's uh, a Wednesday, Maker Wednesday for us, and we've just launched a video today that looks at tonal painting uh, with a ground of uh, a grid that helps us kind of in a calming way uh, paint through a gradation, tonal gradation from let's say blue to red over the course of a grid. And a grid of course is parallel lines that run vertically and then also horizontally to create boxes. And so you could imagine, um, and Deborah Nolan, our colleague has created this maker video with her child. Um, and uh, you might, she goes from red to the, from the left side of the grid to a blue. And that process is actually a calming one, almost a meditative one. Um, Kenneth, when you, uh, if I ask you what you, uh, what comes to mind for grids, um, uh, perhaps in artworks, what do you think of? Well, grids have a very long history in our culture, um, in, in the West specifically. And when I think of grids, this is a view of an ancient city named Timgad. It was a Roman military outpost in northern Algeria and founded in AD 100 by the Emperor Trajan. And you can see even around, even during Roman times, cities were oriented to north, south, east, west axes. The main thoroughfares you see here, which intersect in the center of the slide, are the main avenues um, of the city. But when I think of a grid, I think of human beings orienting themselves in the world and trying to find a place. And you can see that this city is oriented toward the cardinal directions, but that also, in addition to orientation, grids create a field of regimentation. And what I mean by that, here next to the, to the triumphal arch, these were all baths. Here, these are homes. And so you notice that the grid creates these rectangles that have distinct functions within the urban tapestry. And so the grid, in addition to orienting humanity in order to help humanity find its place and also help humanity relate to astrological phenomena, it also creates a system that helps us separate functions in order to live. Uh, that's great. I, I mean, I, I think of uh, Manhattan um, and the numbering of the streets. And that, that's a, a kind of more modern city, if you will, um, with a similar grid, I mean, not the same as this, of course, but a grid structure. I also wanna ask others out there, um, what comes to mind for you, uh, whether it's a city or something else, where do you see grids? Um, I know you have another example, Kenneth. Yes, when we think of even vision and the way we've been trained to see and trained to draw, the grid is integral to those formula. And here we have a wood, a wood cut by Albrecht Dürer um, from 16th century. Um, this is a impression at the Metropolitan Museum of Art dated circa 1600. And here you can see the grid is a screen that is created by a frame with taut strings um, taut string spaced two fingers wide. And here that grid is used to somehow try to gain, try to render intelligible the, this recumbent sensuous nude. And you see, you know, the, her curve, her curved contours and the rippling folds of excess flesh. And here the grid helps the artist who is sitting before a pointer. You see that vertical pointer aligned with the eye where one can pinpoint a curve, a line that one sees in the grid onto a grid um, of the same size in front of the artist so that one can translate the visual experience of the vertical plane into the horizontal plane of drawing. And it was this exercise of rationalized vision through the grid translated onto the flat two-dimensional surface that really perspective was taught to artists in the North. Albrecht Dürer was the one who brought Italian theories of perspective uh, to, to the North. And this was published in really the first treatise that taught 
artists about geometric perspective. And this is why I choose this slide because the way we've been trained to see one point perspective is also predicated on the logic of the grid. So in addition to orienting ourselves in the world, the grid has been used to help orient our vision and orient the way we situate objects within our visual field. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I um, think of, uh, my kids are in grade five and um, just yesterday they were, they were creating grids um, to develop, uh, you know, for mathematics and for geometry. And so um, they spent a lot of time creating their grids on the computer, but also on paper. And uh, it seems to me that they're kind of moving towards what you're describing here. Um, I, just fascinating. Uh, you have another example. Yes, and I choose this. This is a painting from the 19th century by Gustav Kaibot from 1881-82. And this is at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. It's a painting entitled Fruit Displayed on a Stand. And here you can see Kaibot on this canted plane that's diagonal toward the picture plane. What we have here arranged are tomatoes, dates, oranges, apples, pears but they are separated into distinct clusters that, whose edges are governed by a series of parallel lines. And here Kaibots has taken the logic of the grid, situated it in the realm of commerce, and transformed the genre of still life from the deliberately arranged sumptuous displays that one might see in a Dutch still life, for example, into the regimented market display. And it's almost as if he's using the grid to make a commentary on the transformation of our relationship to food to foodstuffs. Um, in this case, now we have the regimented display of fruits separated into distinct categories, so they then can be quantified and sold. And you know, the grid as being a manner whereby we divide the world into categories, and through that division into categories, we're able to begin to quantify it. Um, and but here, you know, Gustav Kaibot is making a commentary on the still life in this um, regime of capitalism. And it's also just such a sensuously painted picture that I really enjoy about the back, well, the, the, white, the white papers um, against which these fruits are silhouetted. You can see just the dramatic and modeling from white to blue. And it's, it's just such a sumptuous picture. And when one sees it, at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the surface is just delightful. Um, but I choose this because it helps us think about the grid in relation to taxonomy and commodification. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd much prefer this display over the plastics that we see in our grocery store that, that cover all of our fruits and vegetables, or many of them. Um, but I also think of, um, I have a tablecloth that is checkered. Um, and so in a sense, it's, a, it's my grid. <laughs> um, and I also think of crossword puzzles. Uh, you know, there's so many ways in which, I, I also think of our screen door, our windows. Um, they are all grids in a sense. And, um, and uh, you're so right in that it, it kind of is part of our lives, this sort of, this kind of organizing and, and, and uh, pictorial sort of um, possibility. It's ubiquitous. I mean, it, again, it governs the way we orient ourselves in the, to the world. It governs the way that we divide the world into spaces with distinct functions. It governs our perspectival mode of viewing. It governs the way we translate visual experience into a two-dimensional plane. And it also governs the way we divide the world into categories and into distinct things that then we can quantify and sell. And so the ubiquity of the grid, it's it's almost invisible and as a result, it's unconscious, but when one begins to think about the way the world is organized, the grid becomes more and more salient. Um, we have a really great work, or I think it's a great work in our collection that uh, we wanted to focus on today. Uh, and that's Agnes Martin's The Rose. Um, tell us more about it. The Rose is painted in 1964 by Agnes Martin. Agnes Martin was born in Saskatchewan in 1912, and she really distinguished herself as an artist in the 1960s in New York City. The Rose is six feet by six feet square. It is a square canvas. Right now it hangs in our Philip Lind galleries where it's juxtaposed with other non-objective works from the 1960s. Um, our Robert Ryman and 
our Ankawara, and it was also juxtaposed with the Donald Judd. But what Agnes Martin has done is she's approached a six by six foot format, the square, which was a format that many artists in New York were utilizing because it's an impersonal format. It's a square. You do not make a decision on how to shape a square because the square pre-exists you. It's six feet on each side. So you're not making any decisions to alter the format. But it's also scaled to the size of the human body. And here is a photograph of Agnes Martin in her studio to give you a sense of how big the painting is but also how Agnes Martin, when she draws the grid, which we will explore soon, how her body had to literally move across the entire extent of the canvas in order to draw the lines. So here is a close-up of the canvas. And the way she made this, first she stretched the canvas, and then she applied a layer of sizing, which is how one ensures that the fibers of a canvas will not deteriorate over time. And then she applied a gesso layer. And when you look closely at the canvas, you can see that the gesso layer is one that she did not sand. She applied it to the canvas, but you can still see the fibers of the canvas. And she left those fibers exposed because when she used either a wooden slat, a ruler, masking tape, or string to map the grid, and you can see how this top line is perfectly parallel with the edge, and then when you look closely, you'll see that little notch marks where then she would lay the vertical lines. And you will also notice that the, horse, the spacing of the horizontal lines is slightly shorter than the spacing between the vertical lines. And this is really important because for her, she viewed the square as a format with a lot of authority and power. And for her, the rectangles that cite the square but are of a different shape, for her challenge the squares authority. But what she does is she hand draws these lines and you can see that the lines run even because they're drawn by her hand and you can even see when you look closely how her hand would shake or skip. Um, right here for example, I don't know if you see that bow. So here was her hand moving and then it just dipped a bit. And so there are hand-drawn grids even though she used a, a string or a wooden slat or some other implement to help guide her her hand was what ultimately mapped this grid. So it's quite a human grid. It's a felt grid. It's a grid that was produced through the movement of her body and her hand. And it creates overall, when one looks at the painting from afar, this atmosphere. And so we were discussing tone earlier and the painting is entitled The Rose. And one can understand why the painting is entitled The Rose as the graphite that is applied is both black and red to the gesso ground. And when one steps back, this grid, and you can see how the red on the gesso ground almost creates, I would say it creates a low value, very cool red. And then when one backs up, you notice how this low value red, it almost becomes, I would say, a lavender. And you can see that the grid disappears. It almost becomes a mist. and the value of the lavender is higher than the cool value of the red when one looks up close. And as one moves more and more away, here you have a lilac and the painting becomes even a little bit more luminous and the grid just disintegrates. And Martin, even though she acknowledges that her paintings are all composition, meaning vertical and horizontal lines that cite the square format of the painting, she also described her paintings as formlessness and breaking down form. And what she meant by that is as your body moves away from this picture, what begins to happen is this grid disintegrates, the value of the red becomes higher and higher, the temperature of the painting becomes warmer and warmer. And here, when you're standing on the other end of the gallery, it becomes this blush. And you can almost see that the painting, it almost becomes an ether that just dissipates before the wall. And the painting itself just begins to crumble into essentially air. Um, and it's you know, quite stunning, her paintings, because she's asking you not so much to just acknowledge the rectilinear format of the grid, to acknowledge the repetition of her gesture, but she wants you to experience this object in space so one can experience its formlessness.
as one moves afar. And so when I installed this painting in our gallery, I purposefully created a large amount of space between the picture and the Donald Judd sculpture, which was originally in the um, gallery. Now it's a Mia Westerlund sculpture so that one can step away and experience this disintegration into formlessness. So one can experience the paradox, as it were, of the rationalizing grid becoming something completely and utterly ineffable and almost impossible to describe. And I think this is the magic of her painting is that she takes this format that has been used for millennia to orient humanity and to divide our world and help us create meaning and logic out of our surroundings into something that resists interpretation and meaning. So good. And yet you were able to articulate what's not often easy to articulate. Thank you, Kenneth. That's amazing. Well, this is I why I study abstraction. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting because uh, um, you, you talk about the hand, the artist's hand, and, um, and, yet, and I see someone on, our, on Facebook, uh, Robin, says digital bitmaps are super gritty. And so I think about this translation to, you know, where, where we're doing a lot of work on our computers um, uh, digitally, um, and what that might mean um, for some new work that we're, we're imagining uh, or more um, something that is contemporary today that utilizes a different type of grid, perhaps. Um, one of the things that uh, I was thinking about, uh, Deborah offered uh, an approach for using paint watercolors to go from uh, a blue to red uh, grid. And I thought, well, what if you don't have paint at home? Um, and that brought me to uh, the work of Lisa Myers, who you just saw before in the, in the shot before. Um, in 2015, she was an uh, artist in residence at the AGO and um, part of her work uh, included a Nuit Blanche presentation, but also a gathering of people, men, many gatherings, an invitation to have blueberries um, that she sourced from Ontario um, uh, that resonated for her, part of her uh, history and memory, uh, in particular of her grandfather who, who um, escaped a residential school and, um, and really lived on blueberries, wild blueberries. So uh, really important uh, subject matter for her and, and material and pigment. And so here you see her spoons and um, and the residue of the of the of the blueberries. And I thought, oh, I'll use blueberries for a grid. Um, and so the next shot, um, you'll see um, what I created: a large um, peanut butter cookie. <laughs> and here you see it on the tin sheet with my my daughters. And what was really great um, was that we had to divide it into a grid um, uh, or we, we tasked ourselves to do so. And then we started to think about the, the variation from blue to red, blueberries to raspberries, and how we might represent that tonal shift. Um, so we cut uh, the blueberries and raspberries. And so you'll see on the right that the raspberries and the blueberries are on uh, the, the raspberries on the right, and then we move it to the left hand side. So there was division. Um, how many squares do we have? What uh, what gets what? And um, finally, you see it on our on our platter, and we're eating it, and then it disappears. So talk about ephemeral work; it's completely gone. Um, um, so I hope this is an inspiration for those who might. Um, consider uh, responding to something like the grid or tonality and um, using what you might have at home to do so in, in fun ways. Um, do you have any, it's, yeah. No, what I enjoy about it is, I mean, you, you know, you're using very much the same concepts, meaning, you know, with Agnes Martin's The Rose, we have the hue, which is red, and we have, the shifts um, across the tonal scale from this very deep red to a light blush. But then we also have this concept of temperature when a hue is warm or cold. And you know, these are just fundamental concepts that artists use to describe color. And, um, and yes, it's, and I, I have to say, I, I'm, I'm quite taken at how your grid is similar to Agnes Martin's painting will um, with time disintegrate. Even if the fibers of Agnes Martin's canvases are sized, um, but when one steps afar, yes, it becomes a mist, just as I guess your your dish will become crumbs. <laughs> I love it. Um, so on that, 
Uh, on that happy note, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, come back next Wednesday as well. Every Wednesday at 1 p.m. we'll chat about some new activity that we're, we're launching um, and hoping you'll participate in with us. Have a great day. Bye everyone. Thank you. Take care.